we can hear you. Thank, um, in case you're not muted. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Bretta. I so we have um, live captions with this, so please do choose a language, maybe French or Arabic, Spanish, if that's helpful, which will hopefully make it easier to follow today. Um, I would also like to invite you all to um, turn on your cameras and just say hello. We can turn them off again straight away if you like, but um, just it's always nice to see that there are people behind the letters and the, the, the screen. So, ah, lovely. Good to see you all. Uh, welcome. OK, so I'm going to um, I'll just put the. Agenda in the in the chat. As well, so we can see what we're looking at today. Uh, we have. Um, or oh, if you could just please mute if if you're not speaking, that would be great. Um, right, so. So we've put the yeah, agenda in the chat. So we have um, some really interesting inputs from colleagues in um, South Sudan, uh, working in uh, northwest Syria, um, as well as our uh, colleagues in the shelter cluster. We're going to hear briefly about the Global Refugee Forum and an opportunity to be involved from the HLP AOR side as well. Um, and going to start with uh, just an update from the HLP AOR. Um, yeah, there's a few a few things that, that have happened recently that we want to update you about. Um, so. Um, I'm going to start there and then we'll then we'll move through. Um, just a couple of things actually before we start. Um, the agenda's in the chat, but please do use the chat to introduce yourselves, um, to ask any questions, to make comments. Uh, we'll also have time where you can uh, speak directly to the to the to the rest of colleagues as well. But I know sometimes it's easier or or people prefer to use the chat. Um, feel free to share links and resources. I know there's lots of things being produced at the moment, so it would be great to share those. Um, uh, and yeah, make make good use of that. So that was that's that's all from that side. So um, I need to just check one thing and then we will. Um, get going properly, apologies. Just checking someone's Yeah, OK, good. So OK, let's let's begin in, in earnest with the agenda. Um, from the HLP AOR side, we're really pleased to welcome our new information management and coordination advisor, uh, Trezor Luval. Um, Trezor will be based in, uh, he is based in, in Dakar, uh, in Senegal. So he's with the uh, NRC uh, Central West Africa Regional Office there. And he will be providing all sorts of support to us uh, as a global AOR um, on the information management side, uh, but also supporting the coordination uh, for the Francophone countries. So uh, it's an area we've acknowledged we haven't been um, supporting as, as well as we could have done. So we wanted to make sure we had extra capacity to support that region uh, and Trezor will be helping to provide that. Um, he began with us in Mar in May and um, has already uh, been yeah bringing in some really good energy and ideas. Um, so I wanted to invite Trezor to introduce himself to you and um, share a little bit uh, about what he's working on. Uh, Trezor, are, are you there? Are you online? Um, I know you had an appointment that maybe was causing some problems, but let's see. Are you there, Trezor? Yeah, uh, thank you, Jim. Yeah, so unfortunately, Perfect. I joined you from from the car, <laughs> but uh, I'm still able to, to to talk. So hi, everyone. My name is Trezor. I just joined uh, the HLP uh, uh, since May, so I'm, I'm glad to to join you. And uh, is as Jim uh, already said, I'm actually based in Kinshasa, uh, in Dakar, uh, where I will be uh, providing uh, support first to the global 
HLPO work. And apart from that, also I will be supporting the, the coordination uh, for, Fran for Francophone uh, countries. So I'm very, very happy uh, to join you. Thanks. Thanks, Trezor. Um, great, to, great to have you with us. Um, I, I'm just going to share a little briefly um, a, a slide that just um, outlines some of the priorities for, uh, for Trezor's role from the from the uh, information management side. Um, so it's going to be working on, and, and this is a new role for the AOR, so it's something we're developing uh, together. Um, and uh, yeah, but some of the areas he'll be working on are around creating dashboards to capture different types of information and um, yeah, that, that, that we uh, gather as HLP practitioners. So specific to responses and what we're doing there, but also to get a sense of who's working where, what the key issues are. He's, that he's available to support uh, your working country as you develop your own ways of uh, thinking about information sharing and, and how you manage that. Doing a lot of work on the website to make that more uh, useful and effective, um, as well as looking at a longer term project to sort of design some standalone HLP AOR web pages that that we can hopefully use to bring together a lot of the many resources that are out there for HLP, both within the protection cluster and sector, but also beyond that as well. Um, and then, as I mentioned, he's going to be providing the specific support to Francophone countries where he'll be able to meet with colleagues and, and spend that time supporting on the, the, the coordination side as well and act as a, an intermediary between the global and, and that regional level as well. And, and, he, and he's available to support on that country level uh, I am uh, as part of the, you know, the wider global protection cluster and the other AORs. Um, and yeah, really looking forward to seeing to seeing um, uh, yeah, his work and have an impact and uh, and uh, um, yeah, get to know him him more and uh, yeah, looking forward to having with us. So you're very welcome, Trezor, and I imagine he will be in touch with many of you if he hasn't already been. So second and less exciting, but still uh, it happened. Um, we had the Global Protection Conference in Amman. Um, so some of you were able to join us there, which was great. Um, some of you were missed. I know there were some challenges with visas and always the challenge of travel uh, is there. So um, yeah, thank you for those who made it and we were sad for those who were unable to for various reasons. Just to give a brief uh, overview from, from our side, um, we had uh, two days where we were just the HLP AOR together. Uh, I think there was about 15 of us in total. And then we also had uh, three days where we were with the wider Global Protection Cluster colleagues. So they were colleagues from different countries who are coordinators and co-coordinators, also the other AORs uh, and some other global colleagues as well. We were joined on the fourth day by um, some of the other agencies that were involved in the Protection Cluster Strategic Advisory Group and some uh, donors and uh, other uh, agencies that are involved in a kind of a wider context. Some of the key takeaways I think from our side were, um, well, we were able to talk through as a group uh, on HLP, you know, information management needs. Trezor was able to join us so he could hear firsthand some of the needs there. We were able to hear updates from different colleagues and the countries they're working in. We were able to work uh, on the work plan, which uh, Ombretta is going to give us an update on shortly. Um, we also had a, a session with the Mine Action AOR to think more about how we collaborate further. We discussed training and training needs. And I think an overall theme was around this uh, need for our work to connect across the nexus. You know, nexus is a word that, you know, instills delight in some and fear in others. But it is a word that we've realised, you know, it has to be, we have to engage with how we as humanitarians work with our colleagues in development, those that are working on peace and conflict, because land, housing, property is such a key part of those uh, of that work and needs that joined up, that golden thread that we talked about uh, across all of those. So that was something that came through. Within the protection cluster and uh, that there's a there's a, an effort to try and work more closely together. So to be more, more coherent with the other AORs and the protection cluster. So we we did discuss 
around how we do that. Uh, is there a possibility to share resources around information management, around the help desk? And I think that will be quite a, a process to see how that works, but we had some discussions on that. We also talked about how do we work as a protection cluster and AORs on things like case management, referrals, service mapping? Where can we do those things together? Where do we need to have separate, specific and specialist approaches to that? Um, so that was an interesting like discussion to begin. Um, and I think we, we, you know, there'll be more on that as we go forward, thinking about how we can really share the resources we have to, to be more effective. And you know, we're talking about that within the protection cluster and the AORs, but it's also very relevant to our work with shelter cluster, with CCCM, WASH, livelihoods, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, so that's definitely a theme that's there. Um, uh, but yeah, and, and it was um, uh, you know it was it was great to to be together and to really be able to spend some time discussing what these things mean for HLP colleagues as well. So um, I'm sure there will be lots we will be following up on in the in the coming coming year. Uh, and one of the things that we were able to uh, to work on together was on the HLP AOR work plan. So, um, Ombretta, just hand over to you to uh, bring us up to date on that. Um, and I will. I did attach copies of this to the meeting invite, but I'll put them in the chat as well if my technology allows uh, to make sure everyone has a, 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 a copy. Ombretta, over to you. Thanks, uh, Jim, and uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone. Um, indeed, those of you who couldn't make it were missed, uh, but it was a good uh, opportunity to to catch up with those who were there and uh, I found it uh, myself as uh, coming new in this role very helpful as well for me to learn the different aspects of protection and how to connect uh, with the HLP, how to feed HLP in those and also uh, better understand the needs of those in the field so that will help us uh, in supporting uh, all of you in the coming years. Um, uh, yes, so the work plan, um, this was based, um, you know, a lot on the discussion that were that took place before the, the conference itself. And thanks again to all of you who gave inputs in the in this process and uh, provided suggestions. And then it was re uh, refined and further developed during the Global Protection Conference. So the work plan uh, has uh, five uh, main areas. Uh, the one you see here now on my screen, hopefully you can see my screen, as community of practice being one. Uh, the second one is support uh, on HLP in country operations. The third one is website and newsletter. The third, fourth is advocacy and visibility. And the fifth one is training and capacity development. So just to give an overview. Uh, I'm going quickly through it because uh, exactly Jim has placed it in the in the meeting invite, so you'll be able to see it in more detail and definitely as as, um, as we go along and we schedule the different events, you will obviously be informed. Um, so there is an aspect of the community of practice work that involves the coordination uh, and coordinating the participation in global meetings uh, where the AOR has a role and these are many, including, you know, some of those that already took place this year, uh, including the conference. Uh, coordinate the meetings uh, like this one. Um, then we we will have some thematic specific discussions. Uh, this is a discussion like today where, you know, we have quick updates and the different streams of work are ex uh, extremely helpful, but uh, we will try to schedule events that are led by different uh, uh, organization and people from the field, from the regions, uh, either on a country or on a specific topics, just to zoom in and focus focus on those particular uh, topics. And you'll see there on the screen, the one that that uh, proposed themselves, um, you know, in terms of countries, but also uh, in terms of uh, thematics. Uh, I hope you see my screen moving. I'm just showing the Excel, but yeah, uh, 
HLP for a quick response, for example, or in customary non register areas where land rights are not registered. HLP, uh, in durable solution, what exactly does it mean? Uh, but also in emergency, you know, of course, we look at the nexus, but also we still uh, need to be effective and improve our efficiency when we at this undertake emergencies. Uh, the all aspects of due diligence, uh, preventing evictions, uh, women HLP uh, rights, and also restitution and compensation. Um, there will be also, uh, you know, the global uh, meeting with the coordination quarterly. Uh, we will continue participating in governance structures that uh, exist, uh, you know, as part of the protection cluster and feedback uh, relevant discussion into this kind of forums. Uh, there is an area that was debated quite at length at the conference, at the Global Protection Conference on data, uh, which we could summarize uh, by saying we need to understand better together uh, the ecosystem of the HLP data. Uh, so what data is being collected at the field level, which indicators are being used, which organization or partners collect what HLP data and how we can help uh, people at the country level to, uh, you know, participate more effectively with data collection and feeding it in the humanitarian needs assessment or any other um, processes that require actually some baseline and targets on HLP. Um, so we'll probably look at having a, a meeting on this uh, later this year. Uh, Unhabitat is also doing some work and I know many of you are as well. Uh, we'll continue striving on being more inclusive in terms of language, at least for French, Arabic and Spanish. Uh, and Trezor definitely and others are a resource on that. Uh, for the support of HLP in country operations, uh, we'll continue to support countries uh, with the work uh, on the humanitarian program cycle, um, and uh, and there are different uh, you know streams of activities there. Definitely, this sort of help desk functions uh, that exists will probably key the, be continue being the key entry point for you to reach out and seek information, help, and then we can uh, Jim and I can help you. Uh, you know, being put in touch with others which had, had experience on that, uh, share, who can share all existing tools that will also be put on the website, uh, etc. Uh, we'll uh, strengthen the part on information management also with the help of Trezor, um, including uh, support with uh, information management to the countries. Uh, we'll continue uh, to uh, carry out the help desk function and uh, organize some targeted missions to some of the countries, depending on a number of factors that uh, that now um, yeah, that could involve, you know, missions of the protection clusters or other country mission or opportunities, maybe of events that happen in the countries where we can, uh, you know, converge and and try to bring in additional expertise to specific countries. Uh, help connecting relevant actors at the country level. Of course, we know that uh, most of you or many of you in the countries have excellent reach out to the countries, to the partners that are in the countries. But, you know, if possible, there will be perhaps uh, additional stakeholders that uh, other organizations have been working with, maybe not so much in the humanitarian field, maybe more in the development field or government counterparts. So let's let's join effort um, to make sure uh, when you intervene in a context, uh, all the key uh, stakeholders are uh, called in. And uh, we'll try to uh, put together a coordination ticket um, to uh, uh, to, I mean, uh, to draw together the resources that are existing on coordination. Uh, website and newsletter will continue the efforts around that. Please do provide information um, so that we can share it from the countries. Uh, and advocacy of visibility, that's very important. This comes in form of events. 
um, or you know, uh, intervening in different platforms, but we'll also support advocacy activity at country level when and when needed, and you know, when the the need is flagged. Um, and uh, connect further uh, and ensure that HLP content gets communicated consistently and more to different humanitarian actors, but also to development actors to exactly bridge this humanitarian development divide along the famous nexus. Um, we are also striving and increasing the collaboration uh, with other uh, actors and clusters uh, and AORs working on HLP, like the shelter clusters, CCM, GBV, Mine Action, etc. Uh, to conclude on training, um, so uh, definitely uh, we'll uh, ensure and we continue trying to make sure that all the training and tool uh, and training materials uh, can be found clear, uh, easily on the website. Uh, we'll scope out for more and ensure basically the, the AOR uh, website becomes a repository for this uh, training materials. Probably some of the ad, uh, some of the partners here are also working on strengthening this dimension, so we'll make sure everything is shared with the AOR. Um, when possible, we'll try to organize and support training events, so please do reach out to us if you are planning or something at the country level that we can complement in person or remotely with additional expertise. And probably we'll try to find some funds also to organize training events where yourselves and your partners can be uh, can take part on. Uh, and uh, lastly, um, I don't remember what is this last point. Um, uh, ah yes, uh, there is a special specialist program on uh, protection coordinator. Co coordination uh, is a training that exists and is offered, uh, and um, uh, Jim has been coordinating the the participation in this one. I'm sure you've been receiving the 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 emails around that. So in a nutshell, sorry, it took a bit uh, long time, but um, this is a overview of the. Uh, of the work plan and um, we'll do our best to to make sure it's implemented timely with the support of all of you and uh, uh, an exciting two years I had to see all the streams of work coming through. Thanks Jim, over to you. Thanks Ombretta. Um, did you want to add anything around the conversation on data? Um, yeah, no, I just wanted to add that um, that uh, as a, indeed, thanks uh, Jim for reminding me, uh, as the inhabitant, we have mobilized, uh, we are strengthening a little bit our uh, data side uh, as our an organization and also the part on um, the, the, the aspect of data and indicators uh, on HLP is included in these efforts. So we have been having discussion with our data um, colleagues to uh, propose a template that we can use to start populating uh, and, and seek all the data on HLP uh, that or at as much as possible data in HLP that is already being collected by other partners, repository of this information, and then maybe analyze it together uh, to see uh, where are the complementarities, there are some gaps, if there are some few specific indicators or data sets that could be perhaps recommended to, to countries that uh, that need to collect HLP data, but do not have a specific um, uh, data collection or methodology in mind already. So what I wanted to say, I mean, this is obviously we're just starting now. Uh, if any of you or your organization want to be uh, kept in the loop and uh, um, contribute to this mapping, uh, please uh, write to us. Uh, you can write to me or me and Jim and uh, we'll ensure um, you, you can be informed a bit more regularly on that and contribute. Thank you, over. Thanks, Ombretta. Um, does anyone have any questions or comments on, on aspects of the work plan that we've shared there? Um, I think one of the things is that, you know, as you know, we, we are a, a sort of a coordination hub for all the um, yeah, excellent, amazing work that's being done by you and by colleagues, and it's definitely a, a collaborative effort. So 
um yeah you know it relies on you being involved in us you know doing what we can to support what you're doing so if there's any questions or comments that'd be great to to hear um either you can either speak them out or or put things in the chat anything that caught your eye uh anything that you would like to be more involved with um, and that's an open question, actually. If there are aspects there that you feel actually align with what you're working on now or, or a particular interest, then uh, you do let us know either here or, or through email or, or other channels um, to, uh, and we can make sure we include you as we're you know, planning and, and focusing on those, those areas. Um, so yeah, I hit, see you have Tamu in the chat there. Um, experience sharing between countries HLPOR so that peer-to-peer -peer, um, exchange yeah I think that's yeah definitely well noted um, we'll make sure we create some opportunities for that hopefully when we have the thematic uh, focus and that's kind of sharing we can um, yeah emphasize the you know country to countries working uh, together Stephanie uh, yeah on the mapping and yeah, making the connections between durable solutions and HLP. I think, yeah, certainly from our side, definitely learning on that. And it's great to have, you know, you and Habitat and others involved to make sure we really push on that. Um, and I see a hand raised. Yeah, Peter, please come in. Hi. Yes, yes. Thank you very much, Jim and Umbrata. My name is Peter Ding. I, uh, I work with, uh, I work as a, uh, I support the HLP AOR in South Sudan as uh, the co-lead. Um, uh, my interest is on the the support for advocacy at the country levels. So um, I wanted to know um, how how you plan to do that and how we could. Uh, uh, work hand in hand just in case I miss that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Um, yes. So, I mean, I can uh, get back and then uh, Jim, please do add. Um, this is obviously can happen in different ways uh, and, uh, you know, has been happening in different ways. For example, I mean, I recall recently when there was the global protection uh, mission to Somalia, you know, there was a set of messages being put out and was the HLP angle was strengthened as part of the broader discussions. Um, you know, it, it can be um, as part for example, uh, for for Libya, I'm just thinking now a recent uh, example, you know, to make sure that this doesn't fall off the, the table when, for example, uh, discussion happen at the UN country team level. So there can be, obviously, there needs to be a dialogue and uh, discussion perhaps from the country level, how things are laid out there and what kind of input will require for the global level. And then we can see how we can come in uh, from the global side. So for South Sudan, perhaps, you know, um, since uh, uh, you are leading and uh, you know maybe where the gaps are, it will be useful to, to see uh, and, and perhaps have a, a separate call to see what can be done from our side and, uh, you know, bringing in the, uh, the global uh, levels from our own organization, but also count on uh, the different processes where we are participating to make sure that if there are specific gaps and needs and opportunity, we don't miss them. Um, Jim, anything uh, in addition to that? I, I mean, basically, yes, that, exactly as you say. Um, I, I know in the past we would have Sometimes we'll have a call or a conversation with colleagues there to discuss some of the ideas. And then if there's examples from other countries that we can share, maybe some templates or um, where they've put together some kind of resource, uh, we can do that. Um, I think um, I know in South Sudan there's been the development of some messages and, and a lot of work around advocacy, you know, with government colleagues, but also beyond. And, and we um, I think it had the uh, protection analysis update uh, that focused on HLP issues there, which was a 
uh, you know, a collaboration between yourselves in country, but also with the global protection cluster as well. So, so yeah, we can. Um, yeah, I think I think the main thing is to have that open communication and uh, talk through ideas and and see what the best support is for for your needs. But we're certainly happy to have those conversations and either put you in contact with yeah people who know more about advocacy than we do or, or draw on resources as well. So, yeah, thanks for your question, Peter. It'll be good to keep in touch on that with you and with Peace and with and with Kezia as well. Um, and um, uh, there is also a question on research. Uh, so I would like to say, I mean, the, you know, probably uh, I don't know. I mean, maybe some of you don't know the, the how the AOR is funded, but with the the AOR uh, is, doesn't have a specific project per se, right? So we do not have funding. Uh, for activities, it's just you know personnel funding for coordination, uh, but we'll ensure that uh, um, you know the linkages are made with opportunities for research. And now I really see uh, you know the need, for example, um, of uh, re more research in Yemen. Indeed, uh, by the way, I was reviewing a piece of research on Yemen right uh, yesterday. Uh, we know there is little available. Um, very few documented as well from our side. Uh, UN Habitat, for example, we are starting soon a regional program for the Arab states where there will be funding for, um, for research. Uh, so we'll make sure when the research, the, the call for research is out, uh, it will be probably late this year or early next year. We'll share with the AOR to make sure that uh, that actually, you know, the countries where there is less, and definitely Yemen is one of them, uh, get somehow prioritized. Um, over to you, Jim. Thanks. Yes. I mean, so yeah. I mean, we we have a like we have a really small pot sometimes for a uh, uh, for some activities. Occasionally, like we did two years ago, we did a an HLP scoping study in Yemen, uh, which tried to understand what the HLP issues were, what who some of the key actors were. And I think that was, uh, you know, played a role in seeing HLP um, coordination start to happen more and more. So, um, um, so yeah, that'd be, I mean, yeah, so, so we could sometimes do that, but I think even just drawing together the different bits of research that are relevant, relevant the things that are being done uh, would be something that we can do and make sure those are shared widely. Um, Joseph, uh, do you want to comment on your comment uh, about adding in something on HLP and appeals? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, I had a recent uh, correspondence with FTS because I was trying to find something else out uh, about HLP and it's not consistently reflected. And then I looked through a bunch of appeals and it's basically very inconsistently reflected in appeals. It appears in narratives, but some appeals are itemized and split out. Um, but as a result, we're not asking for money for HLP, so clearly donors won't fund it. Um, so I think it might be interesting to see something in the work plan about how we see HLP re reflected in the HNO and uh, and appeals pre process, HNO, HRP appeals process. Great, thanks. That's uh, yeah, yeah, really good insight. Yeah, sorry, Ambretta. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's uh, true. And that's actually, yeah, one of the aspects is this data one that I was uh, mentioning because, uh, yeah, we felt, I mean, the discussion were like that because we receive requests and we don't maybe know exactly how to guide enough uh, countries on what data can be put together or how to collect information, then when the needs <laughs> are put forward is it's difficult to have consolidated data. So that's one aspect. And uh, we wanted to start having, uh, not really because I think some people also proposed a guideline on how to address HLP in appeal. So I think we are not ready yet for a guideline, but we will try to maybe put together some uh, examples or document some of the countries where HLP were reflected well in appeals how was how was that possible? You know, what did make it made it possible? Was it the coordination? Was it a more extensive investment on data? Was a better piggybacking on uh, on assessment? You know, just to document and learn lessons where it worked, and then we can perhaps take it forward. And yeah, thanks for sharing the 
the examples from Ethiopia and Somalia. We can definitely look at those. And um, yeah, please, uh, that will be helpful, you know, if um, maybe we can count also new on sharing, maybe even just one page on, on some of these uh, processes. Uh, back to you, oh, uh, Jim, thanks. Thanks, yeah, um, we we did do a little bit of work around trying to develop uh, an advocacy piece for donors around HLP and the inclusion of HLP within, um, you know, guidelines, but also, you know, to to make that a requirement of, of uh, uh, you know, funding requests and, and those kind of things as well. So, and I think that we've been talking about what do we do with that? How do we develop that further? And I think that there's a, a uh, a bit of a momentum around trying to develop that aspect of our work um, in a number of different organisations where I've spoken with, uh, including IOM, there, there seems to be an appetite to try and push to make sure HLP sort of due diligence, for example, is included in, in all kind of humanitarian programming. And I think that can include how we uh, talk to uh, you know donors and, and, and others as well. So, yeah, thank you. That's uh, uh, well noted. Um, Great, thanks for your comments and uh, inputs on that. Um, we're going to move now to um, Eleonora, uh, so P from UN Habitat, who's uh, going to give us a, a brief update on the uh, new training uh, animation around women, land and peace. Eleonora, over to you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, good afternoon, good afternoon. Um, yes, so today I would like to uh, present to you, some of you might have uh, already been informed of Civil on, of Soil Online, um, in the occasion of the um, Global Protection Cluster uh, Conference that was held in Amman, we launched the, um, the training video on women, land and peace, so sustaining peace through women's empowerment and increased access to housing, land and property rights in, conf in uh, fragile and conflict-affected contexts. Um, I passed here in the chat the, the link uh, to, the, um, to the animations. I also included uh, and, a, and a, an animation like this is the advocacy video that was released early this year in the occasion of International Women Day. Um, so the training video um, is, um, it has been designed to be um, a ready-to-use training module that can be used as standalone or it can be featured in other uh, training activity or capacity development activities related to land, uh, housing land and property rights, women empowerment, and uh, it targets primarily, but uh, not only, uh, practitioners approaching the work on uh, on land and gender issues in a fragile context, um, who, without people who don't have an extensive background or technical um, knowledge on the on the topic. So the um, the the video opens uh, stressing on the importance and the urgencies of protecting women, housing, land, and proper, women and men, housing, land, and property rights uh, for um, achieving and maintaining peace. And it provides actionable recommendations for protecting women and men's rights uh, during conflict and displacement upon return and uh, for conflict prevention and in the recovery phase. So, yeah. Uh, he's was saying here in the chat, you can find all the links to the website where it has been uh, uploaded. The videos are available in English, Arabic and uh, French. And uh, I am available um, for any questions that you might have right now or in the future. If you would like to feature your video, the video um, in one of your trainings, upload it on your website. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm here. Thank you very much, Jim. Thanks, Eleanor. Yeah, and please do uh, take a look at those and share them widely. Um, they're, they're they're really engaging and available in um, yeah multiple languages as well. So please do uh, do do that. Um, great, thank you. So we're going to turn now, uh, slightly changing the agenda, just to uh, accommodate uh, different people's uh, availabilities and things. I'm going to turn to Abire Lopez, uh, who's going to give us uh, an update from the shelter cluster side. Abire is the HLP advisor for IOM, but also for their shelter cluster as well. Um, so Ibire, over to you. All right, thanks, Jim. Um, thank you for this. I'm here in the, in Washington DC after the HLP in crisis conference. Uh, so I, I think that for this this short briefing, uh, it'll be interesting to talk a little bit about the the conference and uh, and also some some initiatives that we are 
planning to do um, collectively with with the wider community of practice. So first of all, the conference conference finished yesterday. Uh, it was the first uh, US based conference on HOP in crisis, and the idea was to try to bridge the gap between um, the HOP in emergencies and and uh, the land tenure and property rights work that is done in development. So try to pull these actors together and learn from from them. So I think that uh, in our in our sector, which is the which is HOP in emergency response, we um, we lack a lot of the 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 knowledge that has been built uh, over decades in the land tenure and property rights sector, uh, mostly by uh, private private companies implementing donor um, projects, USAID projects, the FIC projects, see the projects, the World Bank projects. So we try to bridge this gap, and uh, and I think it was it was it was great for that. Uh, we had attendance of um, many many uh, uh, private sector uh, implementing partners, but also um, donors had BHA, USAID, the World Bank. And uh, and then we had thematic uh, areas uh, discussing uh, different issues related to HRP. So I think that the two, the two uh, overarching sort of themes that that came out one was was this the need to further engage with with the with the land and property rights sector uh, to learn from them, learn from their from their tools, but also to to do this exchange so we can eventually get to some sort of coordination, which is today is basically in existence. And the second one was the the way in which we have this dialoguing and engagement with with donors, right? Because donors, even though, uh, like you're saying, Jim, we 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 all agree that, you know, we need to do due diligence before many of the, the interventions that that we do and don donors agree with that. But then at the end, uh, we on, even on their side, they don't know how to to incorporate that, and and many times uh, the the HOP one is just an add-on to a shelter project, for example. Uh, the HOP is cut out of of the budget, uh, and one of the things that we were discussing on how to keep it in there is a way of uh, quantifying the HOP risk, quantifying the the land tenure risk, so that we can justify keeping it. Uh, in the in the proposals, as something that will um, increase the effect effectiveness of the response. So, but I think that uh, there will be an outcome document from the comp from the conference, and uh, I will invite everyone to participate in that. I mean, Jim, you participated virtually, and it was incredible because you prepared recorded videos. And it was like uh, you were featured in a big screen in the conference, and it really felt that you were there because you're also responding to comments that were made in the conference, and people didn't understand how you knew that um, <laughs> that those comments uh, were made. So uh, it was you. You did. You definitely had a, a contribution and a voice there. So it was good. Uh, thank you for doing that. Um, but I think that it merits the the outcomes of the of the conference merits uh, uh, a dedicated sort of debrief with 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 all of you. So maybe we can schedule that for another day. And then the second update, uh, just you know, changing gears here. The second update that is that uh, we've been discussing, we've we've been preparing internally with IOM and and the the um, uh, Latin American region. We've we've prepared some some guidelines for uh, rental assistance programs that have been implemented by different uh, different shelter partners in Latin America. And uh, we got requests from different partners uh, all over the world uh, about that, about uh, developing more HOP uh, uh, guidance on, on rental assistance. So we were discussing uh, with internally and, and with the global shelter cluster as, as maybe uh, a point in our in our work plan to to develop that uh, in, in coordination with with uh, the the wider community of practice and see well first of all of course see what's already already there because there are there are good guidance already there but also see where the gaps are and then try to, to de develop that collectively so uh, yeah so I'll, I'll leave it at that thanks Jim.
Great, thanks. Can, thanks, Iberia. Can I, can I just add a word after Iberia, who is the focal point for the Global yes. Shelter Cluster, to just say two or three words on the upcoming annual meeting for the Global Shelter Cluster, which is strongly related, of course, to, to um, HLP rights as well because uh, HLP rights has been identified as one of the priority topics also for the Global Shelter Cluster strategy, which is um, is just sort of in the making. And I'll share in the link, of course, also the link to the agenda for the Global Shelter Cluster annual meeting, which is taking place June 21st and 22nd, because we do have thematic sessions which link very much, Umbretta, what you just said in the work plan. One is, of course, about the wider impact of shelter, where HLP is a topic. Then there's also, of course, the session about durable solutions and recovery, where we all know HLP is, of course, one of the main issues that needs to be discussed, discussed and considered. So I'll just share the link to the agenda and just wanted to flag that. Thank you. Thanks, Stephanie. And Stephanie, just say briefly your role because you've joined fairly Thanks. recently and some people might not know who you are. <laughs> Sorry, hi. Um, I've joined the Global Shelter Cluster as um, Shelter Cluster Coordinator, and I'm based in Geneva supporting the global team. Um, yeah, and HLP is like very close to my heart because of former roles. Great, thank you, Stephanie. Yes, yeah, so there will be. Thank you. That, there's all sorts of things going on to think about how we work even more closely um, across the, the different clusters and, and sectors. And I think we want to uh, continue that with you know, noting your comment, Carol, in the chat around um, how we connect better with the development side. And, um, and I think that's something that's on a lot of our agendas. Um, Ombretta, yes, please. Yes, I just wanted to as well uh, fully agree with that. And this was part of the uh, the reason why, you know, as an habitat, we felt uh, to, to come in again uh, as a co-coordinator of the AOR and try to bridge the expertise and the uh the even the tools the publications that are being um you know developed for the more developmental you know <laughs> partners that sometimes do not understand uh i mean they're not they understand they understand the same issues but from different language and i think there is a lot of uh, uh, opportunities to bring the two communities closely just by you know having us developing a, a common language or understanding our respective different languages and um, what exactly I just wanted to reflect on the aspect that um, that is key to this whole discussion and uh, Ibera you mentioned is really about the risks the way um, the, the, the development partner understand and mitigate the risk when they come into doing land and housing work or reconstruction work in areas affected by conflict. And that's where is an area where I think the, the, the humanitarian community developed a lot of expertise uh, that could facilitate actually a lot of the intervention that the other side want to do, uh, you know, particularly in reconstruction, exactly. Um, so very happy to yeah, to her that this was uh, really advanced in that um, conference uh, and uh, yeah, looking forward to, to being involved in a discussion uh, in the next uh, month. Thanks, over. Great, yeah, thanks, Sibiri. Thanks, Stephanie. Thanks, Ombretta, for those comments as well. Um, right, we're going to move now to the next uh, part of the agenda. I want to invite colleagues from uh, South Sudan um, to uh, yeah to introduce and share something uh, around uh, a, a workshop on on women's HLP that was uh, coordinated and and happened earlier this year. So I'm going to pass to uh, Peace Mababaze, who's our NRC's ICLA specialist and one of the co-leads of the HLP AOR in South Sudan, along with Peter and Kezia, uh, and also to Dorothy Drabuga, who's the executive director of the Women Foundation for Humanity. So. Peace and Dorothy, you're very welcome. And uh, over to you. Thank you, R. Thank you, Jean, for the kind introduction. Without further ado, we will try to share a presentation. But the bigger part of the presentation will be done by Dorothy, as you have mentioned. Uh, Jim, you will kindly let me know if you're able to see our screen. Yes, we see your screen. So, R. Uh, we will be talking about uh, access to land for women and the challenges and any associated challenges in South Sudan. 
Yeah, so basically, why do we why are we pushing the issue of women and land rights when we know that um, land rights and women is a foundation for livelihoods, for communities, food security, nutrition, and all those things? Um, then we also know that it forms part of it's crucial for forming cultural and identity and then continuation. But then we also know in contexts like South Sudan or South Sudan in particular, women are usually ignored in policy, in structuring HLP uh, rights for women. Uh, so recently, in one of the key developments that there was an assessment done assessing the related legal policy and frameworks, because one of the things that we know that the uh, transitional constitution of South Sudan actually gives rights to women to own land but in practice, that is not the case. So an assessment with the support of IGAD was conducted to check out what, uh, what different policy documents then uh, talk about the women land rights. Uh, one of the things strategic, um, key strategic uh, identified challenges were that uh, one, there is need to protect rights and protection of civil and customary marriages for women to be able to access or enjoy the uh, women land rights. And then um, issues to do with presumptive marriages, because not very many women um, are actually in recognized marriages. And then that leads to the, the then that leads to the, that gap creates a lot of um, deliberate, how can I say, deliberate um, removal or basically that women then do not have a space to talk about their land rights and also to have this conversation because of the, the kind of marriages that they are in. And then one of the things that we saw was the requirement for joint consent uh, for land transaction, both in the urban and in the rural areas, which is also much associated with marriages. And therefore, which they, we also saw that oftentimes the women are then not participating in land registration or in the acquisition of land. Uh, so, uh, so what are the key priority areas that we are working on? Uh, knowing that there is structural exclusion of women, we are working with Dorothy. She will introduce her organization and how they are work and how we are supporting them to work with grassroots women to increase awareness on women land rights, but also to ensure that they, there is more platform given to women to demand for equitable access to land. Um, Dorothy, you're welcome. That's introduction. Thank you. Once again, my name is Dorothy. I am the Executive Director of uh, Women Foundation for Humanity. Uh, maybe briefly um, about Women Foundation, we are a women-led organization. Uh, we mostly focus on uh, women's HLP rights, and also we do women and climate change, we do economic empowerment, we do uh, we also give a civic education to the women and also we do uh, women peace and security 1325. Um, so basically this is what we do uh, under this women's land rights uh, project, we have formed women groups under this project. They are known as Community Women Land Rights and Leadership Forum groups. In Juba, we have 10 groups, and each of these 10 groups has uh, 20, 20 women. And then uh, in Eastern Equatoria, that is Torit. Torit, we have uh, 40 women, and also in Nimule, we have 40 women. So within these groups, we train these women, we sensitize them, on the basic laws in the country that protects their rights. And also we give them startup capitals, uh, like to do small, small businesses so that if they get some problems, especially land related challenges, they can be able to raise money from their businesses. They can go to court. They can also like uh, buy land. So basically that is what, what we do with these uh, women groups. Um, uh, apart from that, uh, Women Foundation for Humanity is also doing advocacy 
on uh, especially the community women, women's HLP rights. And we have also been participating in the review of the South Sudan land policy. We also participated in the South Sudan women's land rights agenda. We are also members of COPS. This COPS is a network for civil society organizations for the ratification of the Maputo Protocol. And I'm happy that recently, last month, the president signed it. And now there is need to disseminate it also. Yeah, so uh, we also like uh, try to sensitize these women on the on some of the international conventions like the CEDAW, now the South Sudan uh, Women's Land Rights Agenda, and the uh, Maputo Protocol, and the Anticipated Land Policy. So uh, this is what we have been doing, but still we have a lot of uh, challenges as uh, in this country, women's land rights are not really observed. Um, issues to do with land, women do not have voice, especially the grassroots women, because we are, uh, we are mostly being driven by the customary law. And most of these customary laws have a negative, uh, a negative towards women. For example, as a woman in the village, if you want to go and buy land, the chief will ask you, where is your husband or where is your brother? Which clearly shows that you as a woman, you have no right, even if you have your money, you have no right to own land because land is valuable and the society thinks that issues of land is a main thing, but not uh, women. So these are some of the challenges that we are really facing in this country, women do not enjoy their rights to learn. Even though these rights are protected in some of the legal frameworks in the country, like the constitutional, in the transitional constitution 2011, and also the South Sudan Land Act 2009. But due to lack of implementation of these laws, women still have a lot of challenges in access use and land ownership in this country and even inheritance, the rights of inheritance. Like if your husband dies, uh, unless you accept to be inherited by the brother of your husband, you will stay in that home. But if you, you don't want, you will go with nothing. Even if you accept, you will remain in that home, but still you will not have ownership of this land just because they say you have been paid dowry and therefore you have no right to inherit but you can stay there when you accept to be inherited by your your in-law now um we had a workshop this year which was uh, supported by global cluster hlp area of responsibility through nrc south sudan we were able to organize um, a workshop a two days workshop which brought together uh, 72 participants. Uh, most of them were women, 66 were women, and then we brought some chiefs. Uh, other participants came from Nimule and uh, Torit. So this workshop was really very good. The women appreciated it uh, because most of the women, because they have not been aware of some of these laws in the country that protects their rights. And during this workshop, they were taken through the basic laws in the country, like the Transitional Constitution of South Sudan 2000, 2011, what it says about the rights of women, and also the Land Act 2009, plus the Local Government Act 2009, and also the International uh, Convention, CEDAW, and also the the South Sudan Women's Land Right Agenda was disseminated during that workshop, and which was really very good. Yeah, so uh, there were recommendations that uh, came out of this uh, workshop. Yeah, so one of the recommendations that came was uh, there's need for more training on women's housing, land, and property rights. And they said the two days workshop was not enough. So and also it's better to do it all over across the country so that all the women of South Sudan will be on the same page. Again, also, uh, 
the, there was a recommendation that there should be research that should be carried on to research on the issues of land, women's land rights in South Sudan, the, the problem, what is the problem exactly? There should be a research carried on to find out exactly what the problem is with the South Sudan women's land rights. Uh, and also, um, uh, and also, one of the recommendations was that uh, they need uh, adult education for the women, as most of them cannot read and write their names. And sometimes these married ones, you, their husband can sell land, and then for you, you don't know, they just ask you to, to sign something which you, you cannot read, they just ask you to sign. So it's very important for these women to get adult education. And also these women needed, another recommendation is they needed to be assisted so that they can get uh, the national identity cards. Because Sorry, if you got don't have... Iberi. Okay. Iberi. Okay, uh, Sorry. Another, Carry on. Yeah, another recommendation is that they needed uh, the women, the, especially the vulnerable women, to be assisted in registration of their land and also the registration of uh, getting these national IDs. Because if you don't have the national ID, you cannot register your land. So there are so many things that will limit you. So it's very important for these women uh, to be supported so that they get the national I identity cards. And um, also there is a need to disseminate this uh, South Sudan women's land rights agenda across the country, including the SIDAO, the Maputo Protocol, and the land policy and also other legal frameworks that really protects the rights of women. This, these are some of the recommendations that uh, came out of that workshop. Oh. Okay, uh, so far, um we have always been engaging with uh, these grassroots women uh, we network and then also we share information with them like uh, some of them now they already know that they know about the south sudan's women's land rights agenda, land rights agenda and also they know that there are legal frameworks in this country that protects their rights. And I'm happy that now some of them, if like they get problems, issues of land grabbing, they come together as a group and they make noise and the grabbers always get scared and they run away. And for me, this, this is really good. There's now confidence in them. They can talk for themselves, they can fight for their rights. And for me, which is really, uh, something good but we really need uh, to do more and um, what is in this recommendation we cannot do it as women foundation because we have limited funding and so we would like to be supported in implementing some of these recommendations that came from these uh, women as we conclude, uh, one of the other things that we are trying to do in respect to these recommendations is to uh, increase on uh, some of the interventions, such as increasing legal and civil uh, access to civil documentation for women in the different parts of the country uh, through different programming. So we encourage the women through the organization to refer cases of women who, uh, who need uh, access to the nationality cards and that is already ongoing and specifically targeting women. And then, of course, there is a lot of awareness creation going on, as has already been mentioned, and providing legal assistance in the sense of ensuring that um, women are able to access documentation for their land. 
Of course, the weak legal system does uh, inhibit uh, access to justice in court. But then uh, we recently had a round table discussion where we targeted um, government, specifically the, the relevant ministries, including the Ministry of Land, to also push advocacy on some of the issues I mentioned here and continue to lobby for the finalization and adoption of the national land policy. But in the meantime, IOM is also doing a lot of work on customary law and ensuring there is a lot of understanding of the protection of women land rights uh, within the ambit of customary law. Uh, thank you so much for listening to us. I thank just, you. Uh, just one small thing from Dr. I just wanted to add uh, the aspect of the women economic empowerment, which has been in the recommendation, but I didn't mess on it. Uh, the economic empowerment part of it is really very good because when we empower these women, they become independent and uh, they get money, they can go and register their land and also they can buy land if they want. They can do a lot of things and they avoid cases of sexual gender-based violence or, gen or gender-based violence. Uh, for me, I think one of the things in this recommendation, especially about the economic empowerment, is really very important so that these women can be confident. You know, if you don't have money, you'll be vulnerable and you will not talk. But if you have something, you are working, you are independent, then you can defend yourself. You can claim for what belongs to you. Thank you. Um, and also maybe just increasingly, we are trying to in, uh, have more women as paralegals within our work such that they are able to disseminate, to do the trainings, to do the uh, provision of uh, legal information, basic legal information, but and targeting specifically these vulnerable women to be able to do it by themselves. Thank yeah, you. actually, right now we are, today and tomorrow, we are, there's an ongoing uh, paralegal training for women. It's going to be for, for two days, which is ending tomorrow. So we brought together 25 women for this workshop for the paralegals so that they will be helping the other women within their communities. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy. Thank you, Peace. Uh, really interesting to hear about that work and makes it really clear the way we need to be thinking uh, of the, the wider um, sort of links between you know, what we might see as our humanitarian work on HLP with those much broader questions that link to livelihoods, they link to policy, they link to legal identity, right across the kind of, you know, development perspective, as well as those um, other rule of law type issues as well. So, um, yeah, thank you for, for raising that. Um, if you have questions or comments, please would you add them to the chat and we can keep a, uh, an eye on them there. Um, but in the meantime, uh, just want to say again, yeah, thank you, Dorothy, and peace for that. And we will be you know, sure to share more information on the outcomes of that in the in the coming weeks in the in the newsletter and elsewhere. I want to turn now to um, uh, Lorena Nieto, who is the Protection Cluster Coordinator for Northwest Syria, or it might be Protection Sector. Sorry if I've got that wrong. And also co-leading the HLP Technical Working Group there on behalf of UNHCR, alongside um, NRC, uh, Skyler kogel who I think is going to present as well. But just yet, yeah, turning to you, uh, Lorena, for an update from your side. Hi, Jim. Thank you. Um, actually, Lorena had oh. to step out for a different sure. meeting. Um, so I will present quickly for the Northwest Area TWG. Give me just one second to figure out how to share my PowerPoint. And let me know if you could, if everyone can see it. Yeah, we can see see it. It's not in presenter mode. It's in the, yeah. That, um, that's yes. fine. We can see it well. That's fine. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Um. So, after the earthquakes, basically, all protection risks and legal needs were exacerbated. In particular, um, we started seeing more barriers to access assistance, evictions, relocations, increased homelessness, and rejection um, of sites. So we have relocation centers and collective centers. So households that were um, 
displaced from their homes due to the earthquake were actually being rejected from these sites because they didn't have their documentation in order to prove that they were in fact displaced due to the earthquake. On the protection side, we've seen an increase in trafficking and smuggling, recruitment, labor and sexual exploitation, and of course, mental and emotional distress and violence. So from the TWG perspective, um, we want we care obviously more about civil documentation and HLP. Uh, after the earthquake, based on a protection rapid needs assessment, 27% of households reported that there are problems relating to housing, land and property, uh, such as evictions and homelessness due to the earthquake. As for civil documentation, Prior to the earthquake, 61% of households had reported at least one family member missing civil documentation, whereas after the earthquake, you can see 84% um, reported at least one family member missing civil documentation. In response to this, the TWG has come up with a strategic framework um, in order to guide our work. So first, we want to scale up our capacity because there are not many legal actors currently operating in northwest Syria. We want to then obviously respond through awareness, provision of services, and supporting other sectors with due diligence assessments. Then we want to start conducting protection analysis of the challenges and opportunities for um, further legal support based on our increased response. Obviously, with the response, we need to address um, risks that are coming up that we identify through our protection analysis um, by running more RPAs through our hopefully scaled up um, partners. And then finally, leading to peace building and coexistence through um, HLP documents safeguarding, restitution, and inshallah, one day, um, a recognition of victims' rights. So within this strategy, our top priorities at the moment are due diligence. After the earthquake, obviously, um, households lost a lot of documentation, but they need to be able to prove ownership in order to have humanitarian intervention, such as shelter. So we had existing tools, mainly a CCCM um, due diligence guidance for informal sites and an unpublished dignified shelter due diligence guidance. We combine these to create one unified streamlined due diligence guidance that can be used by all sectors, then linked with then their specific sectors, um, more detailed due diligence guidances so that they can then modify the streamlined version. But this should make due diligence at least more accessible for all actors in case there are no, are no HLP actors in their area. We're waiting for feedback from the other clusters at the moment, but are hoping to publish it by the end of this month. Then we have our legal awareness and provision of services. This fits under um, the first part of the strategy, which is building up our capacity and increasing the number of partners working on HLP in Northwest Syria. So HLP and uh, legal civil documentation were included and in fact requirements of partners submitting under the SCHF and AF AFNS allocations. Um, the TWG, is then going to support partners through the recruitment processes and then training for the partners and their newly hired staff to be specifically um, uh, aware and knowledgeable, capable of supporting HLP rights. Also, obviously, the regular analysis sessions to make sure that our intervention is in fact um, effective and if there need to be changes or challenges that partners are regularly facing that advocacy or the TWG can support in solving. Then finally, specifically to housing, land and property, our three main um, focuses at the moment our evictions, as I said, we have the receptive centers and the collective sites where mass evictions are taking place. So we've developed a mass eviction monitoring tool to be um, used in these sites. Once mass eviction threats are identified, we'll be working with CCCM colleagues and shelter colleagues to either find alternative locations for the IDPs in the sites or to see if shelter can then intervene in areas where these houses are so that families may return to their houses. 
also the capacity building, as mentioned before, with the expansion in partners for HLP, we'll need to do a lot of capacity building. So training the HLP teams, conducting surveys on what training needs um, the partners need, as well as additional areas of HLP legal support that is needed on the ground and as a fundamental basis for everything, um, communication with community strategies to ensure participation of residents of Northwest Syria. This will also lead into building trust for our third focus, which is documentation safeguarding. So we are in the process right now of developing a questionnaire, which will ask communities if a digital platform were to be utilized to secure their documents, what form and what features would they find helpful on said platform so that we can truly understand from the community what it is they would want from a digital platform. Once this is um, once this information is collected, we'll be working with uh, or we're in discussions with multiple different platforms for hosting the data. Um, we'll then obviously have to train the teams. We're going to pilot it with partner organization Syrian staff first to see what works, what doesn't work, how comfortable they are with it, then rolling it out um, in selected communities, and then obviously eventually leading to archiving of documents, hopefully for the last part of our strategy. Then finally, advocacy. Um, so I see on the agenda that the Brussels side event is, in fact, uh, the next topic, so I won't go into it so far, but um, we are uh, organizing a Brussels side event on rule of law in Northwest and Northeast Syria. Um, we will also be inputting in OHCHR's advisory note on adequate housing in Syria to try to raise awareness around HLP, uh, the fundamentalness of HLP. Then we are trying to arrange a roundtable with the special repertoires of housing and IDPs, again, to raise awareness of housing needs in Northwest Syria and the challenges and opportunities moving forward. Finally, uh, through all of this, we are starting the process of moving from a TWG to an AOR, again, to raise the profile of HLP and HLP needs and responses in Northwest Syria. And that's the end. Thanks, Skylar. That's uh, great to have that overview um, of, of what you're working on. And uh, sounds like there's yeah lots of initiatives there and it'd be great to be able to share the guidance as it's uh, published and, and to hear more about the, the events and, and as these things uh, develop. Um, I think one of the, the key things we can do as an AOR is learn from each other where we're developing and trying things. So we need to um, keep keep sharing what's going on. So yeah, appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, Ombretta, did you want to um, comment um, briefly on the uh, uh, Brussels uh, events? And, and then we'll go to uh, Jamal uh, just after that. Um, yeah, Ombretta, over to you. Yes, thanks, Jim, uh, and thanks, Tyler. I think uh, we were uh, the event you had there was a different one than uh, the one I'm mentioning. So maybe at the after I, I finish, if you want to add a few notes on the other uh, event at the Brussels conference, please do so. But <clears throat> yeah, from uh, the, the one I wanted to brief on is um, the housing, land, and property rights. Uh, brainstorming event um, or roundtable at the Brussels uh, conference on the 13th. And this is uh, intended to reconnect a little bit the different uh, HLP actors that are working uh, inside Syria on the Syria response outside Syria and in the, you know, um, Northwest Syria as well. Um, in light also of the changing uh, political uh, and social environment in Syria, uh, you know, with the, I mean, the coordination work and the, the broader strategy for HLP was set in place definitely before uh, the earthquake and also um, before the latest changes and a little bit the change of the Syria 
posture in terms of diplomatic relation and, uh, you know, before the election in Turkey and, you know, the, the, the situation there is changing quite a lot and uh, different partners had in place a strategy and have done a lot of work on HLP in the past years. Uh, but it seems that it will be a good moment to, to bring all these different pieces of work together and discuss how we want to take it forward, how much, uh, you know, partners are interested in investing on, you know, drawing the conclusion and moving to the next steps or if more of the same is needed. Um, and um, yeah, and therefore, I mean, therefore, this discussion will take place there uh, and definitely we'll be happy to to report back uh, after the event. Uh, over to you, Jim. Thanks, Ombretta. Um, yeah, Skylar, if, if you wanted to uh, uh, add a, a brief sentence on that, then please do, but um, no pressure to, if, if not. Of course, happy to. Sorry, I had some issues with my mic. Um, so in addition, um, we are also organizing the Rule of Law in Northwest and Northeast Syria side event. It's a roundtable discussion on strengthening access to rights, justice, and protection for Syrians as a pathway to resilience. Um, we're going to be just looking at an overview of the rule of law situation, including uh, reflections on what the rule of law is right now in Northwest and Northeast Syria, existing resources and principles, then also key challenges uh, and strategic actions to improve rule of law, as well as then the most important part, which is within this context, what are the opportunities for expanding um, access to legal rights and justice? Um, we're hoping to come out of this with a unified idea of how to better strengthen these things in northwest syria because it has not been um, the most important topic on the table previously and we feel especially after the earthquake given the level of needs um, it really needs to have a spotlight shown on it great thank you skylar I, I don't know for both of you if it's possible for people to join in some way or, or if there's documents around it or maybe guidance that follows up please do share links or relevant information in the chat. Um, Jamal, I'm going to turn to you now. Um, uh, Jamal is the Durable Solutions Officer uh, with UNHCR, so he's the global lead on housing, land and property, and that's within the Division of Resilience and Solutions. And he's going to talk to us a bit, a little bit about the Global Refugee Forum and the particular part of that that's focused on HLP. So Jamal, thank you for your patience and uh, over to you. Yes, thank you very much, Jim. And of course, thank you, Umbretta, as well. And let me first of all say um, congratulations, job well done on putting together a very balanced and responsive work plan, if I dare say. Um, responsive in the sense that it really speaks to the AOR's role in the context of current humanitarian emergencies, which I think is absolutely critical. But it goes even further to also speak to the AOR's role in the context of advancing solutions. In the light of the latter, um, it gives me great pleasure um, and an honor to introduce this brand new initiative that is being spearheaded by UN Habitat in collaboration with NRC and UNHCR um, in the establishment of a new housing, land and property working group in preparation for the 2023 Global Refugee Forum. Of course, the, the goal of this, ref, of this working group is to advance durable solutions, more specifically um, sustainable reintegration, local integration and other local solutions through secure access to housing, land and property. Now, the Global Refugee Forum is an event that happens every four years that brings together the international community to demonstrate solidarity um, with, with refugees and the communities that host them. Importantly, the GRF is an outcrop initiative of the Global Compact on Refugees, the Global Compact being a, a framework of the sorts that provides for more predictable and equitable responsibility sharing among key stakeholders, um, whereby host communities get the support they need 
to lead more productive lives. Um, I think it, all, it is also worth noting that this particular working group has been established in the context of GCR Objective 4. Um, most of, many of you will be familiar with the GCR and its objectives. There are four objectives, but we'll be focusing on one particular objective, and that is to support conditions in countries of origin for return in safety and, and, and dignity. Now, in GRF 2019, many of you will be aware with the GRF, of the GRF and the GRF. This is the second edition of the GRF that will be held this year, um, December. Um, but this is the second edition. And in 2019, several HLP pledges were made. So of the 1,690 approximate, approximately pledges that were made overall, approximately three of them were purely housing, land and property pledges. An additional nine or thereabout um, were pledges, broader pledges that incorporate housing, land and property issues or housing, land and property rights to varying degrees. Thus far, of those 12 pledges that were made at GRF in 2019, one has been fulfilled in its entirety and several other pledges are currently, um, are currently in progress. Now, this GRF HLP working group um, has two specific strategic objectives. The first is on pledge development and pledge mobilization, which is essentially about the advancement of demand-driven and actionable HLP pledges at the local, regional, and global levels through a technical and consultative process anchored in what we like to call real-world experiences of refugee populations in both countries of origin as well as countries of asylum. And the second strategic objective is on capacity building, um, which is essentially about the preparation of a catalog of good practices in five key areas of focus, um, which I would share right now. Now, the first area of focus is provisions for refugee men and women um, in national land policies and national land laws. The second is documentation of housing, land, and property rights for refugee men and women in various settings. The third is resource mobilization and additional support for addressing policy, legal, institutional, technical, and other technological barriers to tenure security. Jim, I see I'm having some competition there. Uh, okay, I, okay, so it's all good now. The fourth is um, scaling of land certification or land regularization initiatives. And the final is building the capacity of national statistical offices for tracking progress on tenure security for refugee men and women in countries of origin, as well as countries of asylum, which is linked very much to a point that Umbretta and yourself, Jim, would have made earlier with regards to data and evidence around tenure security. So I think that is very important, but of course you're both very familiar with this exercise, being the representatives of your respective organizations on this working group. Now, um, with regards to the progress that we have made thus far, and I'll wrap up very shortly, Jim, um, the HLP pledge development and pledge mobilization concept note has thus far been developed and disseminated among key actors um, within the humanitarian space, but also within the development and development cooperation communities, which I think is very important and has now been published as of yesterday on the on the GRF website as part of a new catalog comprising of about eight areas um, that have been that have thus far made significant progress in advancing pledge development work and housing, land, and property. Um, um, thankfully, is one of those areas that has really made significant progress thus far, thanks to the work of our colleagues from NRC as well as UN Habitat. Now, the working group has also officially um, convened, um, and plans are currently afoot to begin the pledge development work in earnest, right? But what I'll do at this point, uh, given that we're really pressed for time, Jim, I'll stick a pin there and I'll hand it back over to you because there are other colleagues who I'm sure would need to um, speak on this subject. Over to you, Jim. Thanks, Jamal. Thanks for that um, overview. And there'll be much more on, on that in the coming weeks and months. Um, really pleased to be part of this. Uh, and just to say the AOR is is, is happy to be involved as well as a, as a platform to, you know, to kind of share information, but also to call on inputs from others from the members as well. Because although we have 
you know, as, as Jamal said, UNHCR, UN Habitat and NRC uh, are sort of convening this working group. We very much will be relying on the inputs from colleagues from uh, a whole range of all, all your organisations and affiliations. So, yeah, thank you for that. Um, I just wanted to call briefly on uh, Laura Cunial, who's um, uh, working on behalf of NRC on, on this area to just uh, add a, a perspective uh, from from the NRC side um, and then uh, yeah and then uh, we'll, we'll sort of shortly draw draw to a, a close but yeah Laura over to you. Thank you thank you Jim and just to compliment uh, on what Jamal mentioned uh, from the NRC perspective I think uh, the GRF is really the Global for Refugee Forum is an opportunity to uh, uh, move up uh, on HLP and really re-raise awareness of issues related to housing land and property. So really bring this issue to the table in terms of a refugee response. It's also an opportunity to uh, continue to advocate for state and for duty bearer uh, for the responsibility in uh, promoting housing land and property rights uh, for refugees. So we very much look forward to uh, being part of this opportunity in terms of uh, developing uh, a pledge or more than a pledge. Uh, this is very much a work in progress uh, uh, with UNICR and with UN Habitat, but also, uh, as you said, um, contributing and bringing in other partners and other organizations uh, who wants to uh, contribute and make pledges. So uh, very much looking forward to uh, this in the next couple of months. And over back to you, Jean. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Laura, and uh, thank you for, for that. Um, Ambretta, did you want to say anything extra from the UN Habitat side, or do you feel it's covered um, up to now? I think it's covered. Thanks, Jamal and Laura. Sure. Thank you, dear colleagues. And I'm aware we've uh, reached just about the end of our allotted time, but just I do want to open up if, if people can stay for a couple of minutes. If anyone had a, uh, an, uh, something they wanted to share, an update, a brief update, a comment, then please um, open to you. Uh, we can, uh, yeah, if people are happy to stay for a couple of minutes, we can see if, if anyone has something they would like to share uh, beyond the agenda. Um, and as I said before, if you have questions, comments, then please. Uh, you can put them in the chat and we'll be uh, following up uh, with, uh, you know, we have a newsletter coming out soon, which will bring together some of these things as well. But yeah, over to you colleagues, if there's anything to share, uh, any updates uh, from your side. Emma, yes, please. Emma, yeah, please uh, come come in. Oh, you can hear me? I can now, yes. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay. Sorry, I have a connection issue, so I can't okay. turn I can't turn on my camera. So uh, I just not need to share something about uh, Mali context. Uh, to do it shortly, we can note that uh, the context remains one of continuing population displacement in the northern and central region of Mali, with a humanitarian situation still giving uh, cause of uh, concern. Uh, today, we can notice in that area uh, about 14,000 14, 14, uh, IDPs are homeless with a risk of eviction for some IDPs in 28% uh, of hundred seats survived it. So they are in need of protection of the uh, HLP. Uh, as activity lead by the HLP working group in Mali, uh, we have the contribution of the development of an emergency and response plan uh, for displaced persons in the Menaka region. We can also have the launch of a Liechtenstein funding project to support HLP Mali coordination in your region. The challenges are the same. Uh, insufficient capacity to, strength, to strengthen data collection on environmental law issues. As perspective uh, ongoing, we have a development of, of HLP referencing sheet to strengthen the due diligence service. Thank you, Jim. Over for us. Thanks, Emma. Thank you for that update. Um, thank you. And yes, and please, uh, if there's any 
if you ever want to share any other information, we can give you a, a, a longer slot in one of the calls as well. So please let's let's arrange that uh, as necessary. Um, OK, I don't see anyone else at this stage and I'm away. We've gone a little bit over our time. Um, so from my side, that's that's all good. But um, on Bretta, over to you to uh, bring us to a close. Thanks, Jim, and thanks all. I think uh, it was a very uh, packed and intense and, uh, I mean, you know, very content-rich meeting. Um, we are, uh, yeah, very happy to to have this discussion and to start, you know, connecting different other groups that are working on HLP. So thanks a lot for that. Uh, and, um, and let us... Uh, keep talking on the issues uh, that emerged uh, during the discussion uh, that require further attention, like, uh, you know, on the private sector, bringing more the private sector in, the peace development actors, the data, the, the GRF definitely is one that, for example, uh, besides the global pledges, there will be also the possibility of putting together and submitting pledges at the national level. So I think many of you at the country level might be interested or are already involved in developing that. So if you need more information, please reach out to us and, you know, we'll seek again the guidance and support from Jamal team to guide you through this process. Um, so with that, I think uh, I would like to thank you again uh, for participating and thanks, Jean, for moderating and organizing as usual. And uh, we look forward to, to continue being supportive to, uh, to the work that all of you are doing. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.